Welcome everybody to the Eon podcast and we're joined by the one and only the message and the money <laughs> Mr. Immortal Technique. How are you sir? I'm fine. Thank you very much. How are you doing? We're good. I would like to start off the podcast with a bit of a story. I want to tell you about how uh as a young kid growing up in Pakistan I was first introduced to your music. and it was actually through a very good friend of mine who lives in this part of pakistan called uh, quetta we live in lahore which is like one of the major cities apart from karachi and this friend of ours he lived in quetta in baluchistan which unfortunately is one of the least developed provinces in pakistan it uh, mm-hmm. borders iran and afghanistan and it's very uh, underdeveloped and there's a lot of violence over there So this guy belonged to like the Hazara tribe and he was in a very underdeveloped part of the country and yet somehow like living in like this mountain village of Quetta he developed like a huge affinity for hip hop and like it was in the clothes he wore and like the way he spoke like he used to wear like these baggy clothes and he used to run in his free time um, I don't know if you remember there used to be blog spots uh they were really big in the early 2000s so he ran like this blog spot where he would upload like i kid you not they were like rap albums that had maybe 200 or 300 people listening to them total in like the entire world and so when he came and he met me in lahore uh he you know obviously like the conversation drifted towards hip hop and he was like what do you listen to these days and i used to listen to whatever was on the radio so i was like yeah you know mnm dr dre and he was like okay that's cool but you know let me put you on to some real shit and <laughs> then he played like some music for me he played uh, jedi mind tricks um from philadelphia i think you're acquainted with those guys he played this group from mm-hmm. new york called the doppelgangers but like the okay. first track that he played for me was uh, you know sort of to blow my mind was uh, called the point of no return which is from revolutionary oh, okay. volume 2 <laughs> and so you know i'm sitting there listening to this track and you need to understand like the backdrop of me listening to this track because this was 2008 pakistan and the general perception at that time was that you know pakistan had sold her soul to the for dollars basically the, the devil Empire, yeah, yeah. and the person who had brokered this deal was a military dictator who had ruled Pakistan from like 1999 to 2007 uh, Pervez Musharraf and at that time you know it was absolute sort of pandemonium because we were sort of reaping what we sew during that war on terror stage and there were bomb blasts and you know uh, huge instability in the country and aman and i went to the same school and you know i remember one day we were sitting in class and all the windows simultaneously shattered because like a bomb went off mm-hmm. nearby and at that time there was this documentary that got hugely popular in pakistan it was called the arrivals and it was like this eschatological sort of narrative about how the world was ending through like an islamic sort of paradigm and you know it had like that uh, sort of religious aspect to it but then there was stuff like you know subliminal messaging in hollywood and music and 911 being like sort of this huge satanic ritual and all this stuff it was it was it was crazy babel by the way it was like zacharias sitchin type nut job stuff it was insane but it got so big at one point that a mainstream news channel in pakistan started airing it so hmm. you know like i was this was like sort of this these things were happening simultaneously where i was watching that stuff and then when i listened to your music you talking about you know the templars of night the templars of the night finding what was beneath solomon's temple and uh, you know just like mentioning the illuminati and all this stuff uh mm. it was like it was really a mind blowing sort of thing for us uh, back in the day and uh, you know a model technique became for us like this mythical figure who would behead the princess and the princes and sheiks <laughs> so and like 
and i was thinking uh, back then like today we take this thing for granted because of like spotify and everything but you released that album absolutely totally independently without any help from major record labels yeah. so the, the first one um was totally independent i did pretty much jumping from studio to studio myself the second one um i was still independent i i, I paid for everything but then i had um some distribution um through viper records and then through koch um eventually and then emi but um yeah i think my journey as an independent goes from being um independent to being very independent to now it's just me running everything it's a lot easier to hold down an operation that's of this size with only a skeleton crew you don't need uh, 40 people working at a record label anymore um i think that the world of music obviously changed a lot because during the 90s you still had people that would go to studios and record on reels you know when things got automated it changed the game for everyone i mean the 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 entire roster of artistry that you see making music today wouldn't exist in the world that i come from where you had to you couldn't just punch in someone's vocals you had to go back and re-record over the reel and then people had to cut the tape and put it together at exactly the right place so that the words would blur together and now you can do that on a computer program called pro tools which makes things a lot more efficient um you know i also came at a time in which people were doing uh what exactly you describe and looking down on it and 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 with a really vile attitude about oh you're pirating or you're stealing and to me that was not my perspective um i love getting paid through what i do but initially Burn what it started off the was, internet and right, pump it outside essentially i wanted <laughs> people to to disseminate the message and there were parts of it that i think were um were using extreme language and extreme examples but anything that i said or anything that i've rapped about um i find myself able to defend pretty well um when it comes to people that ask me follow up questions about that and they'll say well you know felipe how do you feel about being a conspiracy theory artist and i say well okay let me ask a question on the records that i have um what were my big conspiracy theories what that the iraq war was based off of lies we discovered that later on that that's true and that was sad and you know you know i saw a, a video of a russian tank running over a ukrainian man and it was it was it was disgusting it was hurtful to see it the waste of human life that way but why are you so eager to show me that but you're so uneager to show me all of those afghans that you blew up all those people from somalia and pakistan you blew up with your drone strikes why do i never see their faces why do i not even know their names are they nameless are they worthless are they nobody or well, why did you hide them from me why did you not show them to me with the same pride that you showed me the 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 horrific atrocities allegedly that have been committed by people that you're ideologically opposed to or financially opposed to which is what it really boils down to and and i think that really gave me an awakening um or or it it is an example of the kind of awakening that i received during the war in iraq when i first said hey man what i i, I was looking at the type of stuff that wikileaks was releasing beforehand you just had to dig on the dark web it wasn't like it was everywhere but you could find it and it was extremely disturbing images where you said this isn't freedom you're not you're not helping people you knocked over a country because you could and you've decided to try and angle out Russia from an arms market now whether or not that's a, a conspiracy theory it's true now right Russia used to have a, a a monopoly on the arms market in the Middle East and as a result of 9/11 and our knocking over um a series of countries and then after Bush inviting Mr Obama to do the same thing i mean you know he won an election against Mr McCain by purporting to be a progressive and we ended up with a person that knocked over another seven countries that uh definitely flexed the might of american imperialism and what were we left with you know a state that didn't work on its infrastructure so when i have these kind of discussions about hip hop i remind people where hip hop comes from hip hop comes from mass poverty and it comes from being able to take anything 
from that wretched condition and make something that other people envy, right? You took away a broken record player and what did you do? You created new music with it. And, and people said, look at these slums that you people come from. Yeah, yeah, but that's not where we're from, right? We actually have a rich history before we were brought to this country and before people were forced to flee wherever they are. And, and, and I think that that's important. So whenever we talk about hip hop, remember even the baggy clothes that your friend wore, that's a jail style. You know, that comes from people that are were sent to prison and they didn't want to wear tight clothes for obvious reasons. They didn't want to be targeted and, and sexually assaulted. And when you wear very tight clothes in jail, you give people the impression that you're open for business. You know, another it's just sad, but it's true. But when you wear baggy clothes or you wore baggier clothes, people said, oh, man, that guy, he must know somebody. He got the hookup. He Look at his clothes. He, he's looking. He, they're not tight. They're all they're loose fitting on him. He's relaxed. This is where the actual style comes from. It it's sad, but it's true. So it's 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 a it's a very very clear message to people. This is a a culture that comes from struggle. And if we don't speak about struggle, then we're not using it till its full potential. Sure, you can use it to distract people. I'm not one of these purists that you'll speak to. Oh, this this other music is haram and it, it's horrible and it should be banned. No, it, it it's a it's an it's an example of ignorance and societal norms that can affect anybody. Even the most religious person's children can be drawn into that. You know, a- any individual that loses their way can be drawn into that swamp of materialism. You know, even the most righteous person is at some point tested in their life. Otherwise, they're not righteous because they've never been tested. How could a person be righteous, right? purport to be so unsinful and never have ever encountered anything that shaitan puts in the way that makes it difficult for you to make a decision, right? How are you righteous if you've never been tested, if you never had to make a difficult decision? And I think those are the themes that I loved about early, you know, hip hop and what I saw where it was, it was an actual moral tale. There was something going on, even with Dance with the Devil, people always bring that song up to me. It's a tale about morality. I can show you the building where it happened, where these people murdered somebody back in the day. And why speak about that? Well, I, I unless people haven't noticed, I say whatever I want to. And what are those people going to do? Harm me? Expose themselves for being the individuals that were responsible for killing somebody? No, they're not stupid. They're going to shut the fuck up and they're going to die slowly somewhere like they've done so far. Those people are cursed. That's the that's the lesson, right? It's it's like Star Wars. It seems like, oh, man, Darth Vader is so cool. No, he's not. Listen to George Lucas. He's a wretched, miserable, disgusting, lonely, horrible, haunted character. He's not cool. He's he's a legless, armless quadruple amputee who thinks he's responsible for killing his wife and child. He's the biggest tragedy in cinematic history. And people think he's cool. He's just an example of everything that's gone wrong and the biggest wasted talent in human in galactical history in his universe. And I think that's what people miss. But he you redeems know, there himself is in the end. Though. Yeah. Sorry. No, I said he redeems himself in the end though. I think yeah, I think that, but that's the interesting part, that if there's redemption for an individual like that, see, that makes the story hook. If there's an in, if there's redemption for an individual like that, the whole purpose of every movie is to break the fourth wall. If it doesn't, then it's not impactful. If it doesn't bring a message home to you at some point, oh man, this is really, wow. If, if this guy can redeem him, so you know what I can do? I can call my mother. And I can tell her I'm sorry for the things that I, you know, or I, I can, I know that my, it's my dad's fault. You know, I know it's his fault for what he did, but as a, a man, man, I'm still going to forgive him. And, you know, as long as he's sober, he can be around my children. And then, you know, you, you find redemption in that. And I think that was what was great about early hip hop. The, the, the character arcs, the idea that a person could be a drug dealer and still not be the worst person in the world. Or the idea that a person that's hooked on drugs doesn't have a moral failing. You know, they're just sick. They have a disease. And I think being in a so-called Christian country for years, um, we saw, excuse me, not for years, for decades, 
we saw in a self-proclaimed Christian country how people are constantly shamed for having a disease. I mean, if you're addicted to heroin, you cannot quit. You cannot quit cold turkey. You, you'll die. You have to take certain drugs to get off heroin, and that's heroin. Think about a less complex drug, alcoholism. You, if you're, if you're uh, going through pathological organ change, which is the final stages of alcoholism, where your body is now processing alcohol like actual nutrients, and this is like 20, 30 years in into alcohol, you cannot quit alcohol. Your, your body will shut down. You will die. You have to take certain drugs that mimic what alcohol does to your system for years and then get off drugs. This is a physical death. And yet we have so callously and so carefully, meticulously made it seem as if it's a moral failing for people until the demographic shifted, until we had a conversation about who were the bad people, right? And then a rich white American society was forced to look at itself and say, wait, but, but, but my kid's not a bad person. He's not a monster, but he's addicted to drugs. He robbed a store. He, he did this. He said, no, my kid's not like that. Well, then if your kid's not like that, then no one, no one's kid is like that. Because all during the 80s and 90s, when the people who were affected by crack and, and heroin looked more like me and the people in my community, it was not considered a, 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 a medical issue. It wasn't considered a disease, which it is. It was considered a moral failing and totally the responsibility of those involved. And unfortunately, we lived by that principle for decades. And it, 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 it ruined our society in terms of having empathy. And also, the people who judged those drug addicts uh, made the worst mistake of all. They lost the moral argument in the very beginning by assuming the moral high ground, because that's not where they belonged. And by looking down on those people that had you know, were fighting for their souls. And instead of helping them, laughing at them and kicking them while they were down. It's easy to do, man. I've seen a lot of drug addicts on the street today. You, you know, know, it's actually, not an easy thing to fix in our society, it's, but it's something that was easy to cause. It's interesting because, um, you know, as a 12, 13 year old kid, uh, one of the first things that made me sort of, you know, delve deeper into like this drug epidemic was the song Peruvian Cocaine. And, uh, mm. you know, again, that's a track from Revolutionary uh, Volume 2, where, uh, you know, you talk about how the CIA sort of manufactured uh, the drug cartel, uh, or at least it was one of the main uh, sort of buyers or purchasers of drugs. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently it was prosecuting its own people uh, who it had previously sold the drugs to. Uh, for Ooh. buying and using those drugs. Um, and actually, with a lot of your music, uh, that was the case that it really opened, you know, a lot of sort of avenues uh, in terms of geopolitics, in terms of just, you know, like understanding things on a different level. Because I, again, you know, we were 12, 13 year old kids. And uh, mm -hmm. I think your music actually played a big part in sort of that political <laughs> awakening that we had. Mm. Um, I and, appreciate that. Yeah, and Aman and I, I think, uh, <laughs> often discuss this, that, um, you know, that album encapsulates that time period so well. Uh, that sort of paranoia after, you know, 2000, uh, after September 11, uh, the world order shifting, you know, as you say, the devil crept into heaven, the new world order was born on September 11th. Uh, and, so, you know, like the Patriot Act and all of this thing. Um, and one thing that I would like to know is that you have like this sort of repeat or you have another large scale global event happening right now uh, with what's happening in Gaza. And uh, from your perspective, you know, looking back um at September 11, do you think that this time things are different in that it is not mm. so easy to control the narrative for the powers that be as it was before mm. during September 11? Because at that time, uh, you know, with the Bush getting elected, we saw that he had just like a wholesale sort of sweeping approval rating after September 11. 
and it seems to us you know living in pakistan that the americans at that time just bought wholesale um what I mean, the establishment was selling not exactly wholesale i mean first bush got elected then he knocked down the towers <laughs> and um the to quote the great model technique himself um but i think the american people didn't buy it wholesale you had the iraq war protests but on the level that we are able to communicate right now so maybe this conversation wouldn't be happening post 911 so the idea is that mm. the american media establishment has a very good uh, a reputation of putting a, you know putting lipstick on pigs and this time around they're having a very hard time doing it i mean you and i are able to have this conversation we're able to gush about how deeply entrenched your music is in is into is into our sort of uh, political awakening and and our growth And one thing I'd like to say myself I mean, about Revolutionary Volume Two is that it's the every single track on that uh, on that volume is ominous. That's the exact <laughs> word I would use to describe them. They captured the spirit of the two thousands because that's what everything felt like ominous. Mm-hmm. I think when I made those type of statements, they were the first ones that got challenged. Like when people said, "Oh, technique, how, how can you say that?" what the CIA controls the drug trade here's another conspiracy theory and I'd said well okay here's here's the truth in my country in Peru I can give you one prime example when uh the dictator Fujimori came to power he had two big problems he had a uh a, a group of maoist leftist guerrillas that had splintered off into various groups and he had a drug cartel problem because everyone uh understands the american lexicon of saying oh look colombian drug lord we've all heard that it's in all these movies but you know very rarely do people say peruvian drug lord we don't hear that as often and yet peru moves just as much cocaine as colombia and i think that with out that fundamental understanding um people miss the fact that you know fujimori came in made a deal with the people that sold drugs and copied their tactics went from place to place building wells and roads and why do drug dealers have so much success in rural areas why aren't they turned in by the local population and the reason is because they end up doing more for the infrastructure of those places than the government they build a bridge so their drug trucks can go through it and it just so happens that people are able to get to work and see their family or they they fix a road or they they build a hospital or a school and you know i think that that's the way government operates too like a like a drug cartel they build something nice for the people when they're finally under pressure they come clean about what they did wrong when they're finally under pressure but they never do any of this alone this requires public pressure it requires human interaction right it it reminds me of why people are religious whether you take the quran whether you take the torah whether you take the bible all of these three documents whether you believe in one and don't believe in the other two or you believe in all of them the truth is that all those documents are subjective documents which means they require human interpretation for existence without us being here it would just be a book that's lying there and everyone would be prancing around just being animalistic or living in another society also let's not forget this that we live in a unique time in human society and like you said yeah it captured uh, an era but it was capturing a time in human society that i would liken to the vietnam era See the Vietnam era I think is a perfect example because during Vietnam people really believed their government brother. If their government said oh they're communists in the jungles of Vietnam, well of course we have to go confront them because they're going to try and take over the world. Mm-hmm. They're going to ruin nighttime television, you know, they're going to they're going to nationalize everything and nothing will no no freedom anymore. And people believed that. And so they began to believe that a guy named Timothy Osman that used to work for the CIA now known as o- Osama bin Laden <laughs> was solely responsible for all of these things that took place and there was no uh, uh nefarious backdoor dealings which there always are um, there there wasn't the presence of another empire which is Britain which caused the situation and i think by causing it i mean that it sets up all of its post colonial territories to fail in a in a, in a way that's very similar it divides them according to sometimes racial 
uh, sometimes religious and cultural lines. And at first it puts all these people together that existed amongst each other, but forces them to be together in a way that makes them uncomfortable. And later on, when it provides so-called freedom, what it does is set these entities up to fight against each other. And what you get is the idea that colonialism, and more specific, Euro- specifically in this case, European colonialism, was the highlight of civilization for those places. Without people forgetting the thousands of years of history, whether it's Central Asia or the Middle East, that those places have, and the achievements in math and science and understanding that technology and history is not linear. And simply because the United States has built a series of better killing machines right now doesn't mean that that's the place it'll be in 2,000 years. Look where we were if you lived in Italy, in Rome. Where the fuck if you live in Italy, in Rome? You There's not even Italian people making pizza. It's all Egyptian immigrants and other people. Like, this is, this is your society is run by your... This is what you are as a Roman? Okay, you, you don't run anything. You don't even run Italy. You know, but you were the centerpiece of an empire that ran most of Europe and parts of Africa and the Middle East and, and even Persia. And it's insane to think that. But here we are. And what we have to focus on is the survival of our human society and of the decency within us to each other. Because without that, we'll lose who we are as a human race and we'll continue on in some sort of like manufactured and purported humanity, which is what we're developing into. You know? and whether that's secular or dome. whether that's because of, because of religion is another debate. I mean, you talked about computerized humanity living inside of a dome. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to mess with you the whole while because no, <laughs> we sure. love you. Um, you want to take this this broad spectrum image of humanity and you want to be able to export that to everyone you know you see that happening already on the left and the right i mean the left right paradigm has started to end because in america in my humble estimation of things uh, the republican democrat the two party paradigm has worked up until now uh, i think donald trump broke that mold in the sense that people sort of lost their minds on both sides of the aisle and I don't mean this in the Trump mania sense of orange man bad or any of that thing. What I mean is that this realization that the both both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. So you talked about the two wars of the Republican Bush, but then Obama comes up with his seven wars of smart wars. He calls them smart wars. That's the smart war doctrine. And it keeps getting worse and worse and keeps ramping up. And there is a common thread between the left and the right in America now, even in Europe as well, that maybe the left-right paradigm really doesn't exist. Because you see a lot of people on the right have started to give up on their ideas about capitalism even, because they're realizing that they're hurting. They hurt through the Obama administration, they hurt through Trump, and now they're hurting now after COVID and with these forever wars. So for the first time, I see that Republican voters in America don't want to go to war. But now I see that the Democratic establishment wants to go to war in Ukraine. <laughs> It's just, it's just completely, yani for me, it's so confusing because I grew up with the certain image of with Bushisms and, mm-hmm. and, you know, the Republican voter and the Tea Party and the sort of very crazy sort of right that existed in America. Right. And now I feel that the script has, has flipped. flipped. Yeah. So it's, it's a very strange, like where the left and the right to me are now almost like a circle as opposed to a straight line. I think, I think it's interesting because the one thing that doesn't change, um, in any of that is that the right wing has been running on the same platform for 225 years of free speech. And yet only recently have they understood a few of the more intricate aspects of like human society and development. And in terms of what they've accepted, right before they wanted to, to change humanity with, you know, this idea of American exceptionalism that we're somehow more moral than the rest of the people. And it's almost like one of these big buildings somewhere else in the world that someone started and just never finished that we're looking at. And in terms of Republicans and Democrats switching, I think it's interesting because during that era, I remember very clearly, and I appreciate you bringing that up, that Democrats acted as if they were anti-war. To me, that's more surprising than anything else because those people never met a war that they didn't like. Um, And I think that what's sad about it 
is that now um, right wingers have adopted in this little switchover have adopted the, the premise that they care about um, subversive politics, that they're counterculture. Right. All of a sudden I'm bucking the system. No, you're the system. And now you're bucking the system as yourself. You know, you're trying to overthrow the system. You're a revolutionary. No, you're not. You're a pasty person in a suit that is presenting the ideas of rich people to a platform that's digestible for the plebeian public. And that's what your job is. We, we, we don't get news in this country. We have the opinions of rich people that are translated by human teleprompters to the masses in the hopes that they'll take the bait and actually start thinking that way. Now, whether it's from the right or for the left, they affect people in different ways. But one thing is stable, that in America, there's a growing movement of zealotry. And people call it, you know, the, the American Taliban, Al-Qaeda, the Al-Qaeda. That's, they make fun of these people. But realistically, I, I'm never, never um, in a position to take anyone lightly who has extremely strong beliefs that are backed by things that can't be proven. And those people, whether they choose one religion or another, are dangerous. And I'll tell you why. Because they're the first one to violate the tenets of their faith. They're the first ones to kill somebody else and say, I justify this with the Bible or the Quran or through my history of controlling this area 2,000 years ago in, you know what I mean, in, in, in the sense of what's going on in Gaza. I think that those people are the greatest hypocrites in my mind because they want that that legality of God, you know, Christian Sharia for everyone else except themselves. It's always the same way. Whenever I run into religious fanatics, I always remember it's not the life that you want everyone to live for the sake of their morality. It's the life you want everyone to live for the sake of what you think morality is. And I think that is the most difficult question. How do you force that? And then what becomes the benchmark for morality? What is it that makes a person moral and correct? You know, in, in our society, you know, we, we have uh, the ability to give charity, right? And I, I say, oh, wow, what's one of the pillars of Islam? Saget, that, that's amazing. But here's an interesting question that I, I posed when I was in Qatar. I was invited to, to Georgetown to speak. And I said, if you give $10 million in charity, but you know that you're going to get $20 million in tax breaks, and you know it is, it's not, it's not maybe, it's guaranteed, it's not Zagat anymore, is it? No. It's not charity. Now, the people, here's the, here's the, 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 the philosophical conundrum for all of us and your audience to consider. The people that are getting that $10 million, man, they'd be starving without it. They're suffering and they're hurt. And it's technically charity for them, but it's not really charity for me. It doesn't come from a place where I'm losing anything for nothing. I'm gaining as a matter of fact. It's a business transaction. And that's what capitalism has done effectively. Turned it into a business transaction. Make a, a Ponzi scheme that was invented in the 15th century seem like the only option that people have. And if you could make a critique of what the left is, because unfortunately, I don't think we have a clear definition of that in our society, if I could be honest, because there are too many people that think anything left of hunting the people uh, who are homeless for sport <laughs> is communism. And I think that's a problem, because if you have people in America that are, are calling themselves serious political scientists or they even have a channel on YouTube and they are purporting that Mr. Biden himself is a Marxist or he's a socialist <laughs> and 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 I think that's laughable. It it it, but it's true. You're laughing too because th these individuals are in I would call a, a the new Napoleonic era, right? Like everyone's talking about this the historical inaccuracies of the new Napoleon movie. But here's an interesting fact about Napoleon. You know, he had a newspaper. He had he had a, a couple of newspapers. And you know the funny thing is, gentlemen, he was the editor of these newspapers. And he used to write these articles about himself or edit the articles that other people wrote. And if you read these ancient newspapers, he said, oh, Napoleon, like, bravely dashes across the field while everyone else cowers, 
waving his sword and going, you know what I mean? Think about that. Think about the ego and the, the audacity that it takes to write something like that. And you'll find that on right wing YouTube, a whole bunch of Napoleon got destroys liberal argument. This one shatters first year <laughs> college student in debate of lifetime. These people are Napoleons of their time. They, they, they're writing their own PR, which I think is amazing because I, I always saw that as taboo, but that's just the, the, the par for the course now. And I, I think you're right in saying that the, the, the previous 9-11 could not have existed in this era because of social media. But I will say one thing. I think to compare what's going on in Gaza and now, um, even though they're totally different, and to use 9-11 as a comparison, I was at first against, and I, I was very critical of that. But now I think it's a perfect example, and I'll explain why in 30 seconds. At the end of 9-11, America had the goodwill of the entire world. Everyone felt sorry for them. People jumping out of windows, dying. Oh, my God, how fucking horrible. Their people are dead. They're hit by jet fuel. Other people cr crumbled in a building. Everyone gave them benefit of the doubt. And within five years, they had wasted all that political capital. They had killed countless people in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other countries. And they were angling to continue their operation in, in Iraq, which ended up costing a lot of a million people for absolutely no goals that you could present to me now that would make it worth it in any way, shape, or form. And most people in America agree with that, which is amazing, because where did all these cowards that were rubbing their pussy to dead children for 15 years. Where did they all go? Are they all hiding behind Mr. Trump's skirt? Because we know you're still there. You're in the party. You have a voice. You had one for years because your voice made that 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 those atrocities possible. But if you but if you look at it, same thing has happened here. In the course of this time, everyone said October 7th, horrible, man. Even if it's in context of a 75-year occupation, man, this is terrible. And then in the course of not five years, but five days, <laughs> we showed the world that, you know, indiscriminately bombing women and children is something that they're willing to stand by and that they don't think it's a genocide. And when people say, oh, how could it be a genocide? You say, well, how about this? What if we purport that not a single innocent civilian was killed on purpose? Right. What if we're willing to give you the so-called moral high ground that people expect they started the argument with, especially if they're a Zionist? Right. I, I started the argument with the moral high ground. OK, let's say you didn't kill a single person on purpose. You destroyed 300,000 homes on purpose. Imagine that. Imagine going to Lahore or, or New York City or or or. or or Jalalabad, or any other place, any place in the world, any place, Kabul, or, 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 or Paris, or, or, or any capital, in Moscow, and you, you, you take away 300,000 people's homes with no shelter, no food, no, no, no protection from the elements, and on top of that, you're raining white phosphorus on them. Not only, listen, just, just, just making those people homeless is already a crime, right? Already making those 300,000 people homeless, of which you know about mm, roughly 3% are going to die, that's already a crime. That, in that sense, is already a crime. And you did it purposefully, and you don't deny at all that you wanted to get rid of those houses. As a matter of fact, you're proud of getting rid of those houses. You said, matter of fact, we warned everyone in the house. We even sent you a message, a phone call, and some leaflets we dropped on you like it was fucking Tokyo in 1944. We dropped leaflets and told you we didn't want you here, and if you don't get out, you might die. Now, none of you were killed on purpose, but all of your homes were destroyed on purpose. I think people forget to read in between the lines and 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 they can see the objective of a person is very different than what they say. And that's the masterful uh, work of politics, getting what you want without saying what you want to get. Right. I mean, you're right in the sense that. Trump's anti-war stance and then the right that was supporting that anti-war stance, it was a, it was not a principled stance. It was a practical yeah. concern when it came to the Ukraine-Russia war. It was a practical concern when it came to invading Syria. Uh, but the moment that the Zionist lobby, uh, you know, gave the go-ahead for uh, the genocide in Gaza, you see not only Trump, but you see the, the whole roster of the Democratic and Republican Party, you know, vying for the presidential yeah. seat right now, in lockstep, they all say, you know, Israel has a right to defend itself, and they're, they're like they're falling over themselves. 
and in this strange uh, i would describe it as navel gazing you know universal navel gazing event in 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 new york and in universities in california jewish students are not safe over there uh, mm. you know you have all these white cosmopolitan uh, politicians not feeling safe on the streets of new york it's not the gazans that are in, in trouble right it's 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 mm. it's it's these it's it's these white people it's these it's these war mongers in america who are not feeling safe in in universities and in uh, in 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 the corridors of power Don't, i think uh, one yeah. of the thing that you you bring up by saying that is the idea of projection and that's very important you know because i think especially if we're talking about this occupation it's the only occupation the only brutal military occupation where the people that are doing it are presenting themselves to be the victims right the romans never hated where the victims you know salahuddin never i'm the victim no no you're the victim you're going to get kicked out of here and i'm going to take your land back to who it belongs to originally or or or, or the mongols they never said hey, we're the victims here no 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 you're definitely on the menu and i think that's the interesting part that we've reached a point in society where people are no longer proud of being the great conquerors and doing things the way they used to. Now, a thousand years ago, people would say, "Oh, no, I laid waste to those Palestinians. Yeah, I sold all their people into slavery." Ah, uh, and and we would think, "Hey, that's exactly how people thought a thousand years ago." But here's the tick. And this is the part that's sad about our human society. That's not how they're going to think a thousand years ago. That's how they're going to think a thousand years from now. when whatever we have left of whatever society this is crumbles and we're forced to rebuild for whatever reason it is and maybe just maybe if any of my work survives i can give people a warning and an understanding that we've been through this before we did this again and if you want to go down this path then that's why you'll be stuck in the same cycle again for example when i called the the album the middle passage for years I, people have asked me what happened with that record it's going to come out eventually but when people ask me is it about slavery in the past and i said no here's the sad part i don't think slavery is the history of humanity i think that it unfortunately will be the future of humanity and that's nothing that's happened now has made me change my mind you know as you said before brother when mr trump came in uh he purported to be anti-war he didn't start any wars but he continued them all heartily you know 18 months after he was elected and brought into power the drone strikes that obama was so famous for continued so i think that it it needs to be to bear in mind that as much as they purport to be different than each other when it comes to you know the hegemony of the united states and the united states relationship with israel they're all on the same page and i think it's because they have to be um the united states has i want to say about 12 to 20 bases independent bases for its own military inside israel um i think people don't know that but the united states i think that there's there's a lot of these negative anti-semitic tropes that affect people online and i always say that whenever you believe hateful words about people be careful because what you believe may actually throw off your understanding of context it's not that israel controls america it's not the tail that wags the dog it's not jewish people in washington pulling no the, the united states controls israel it tells them what to do it does things that america can't do and i i, I said that in one of my other lives I gave a perfect example when the United States was backing Iraq against Iran um documents that were re- recently released um from the Reagan administration proved that we didn't want Iraq to win this country just wanted those two countries to decimate each other so neither of them would be a regional threat to any design that we had now because Iraq enjoyed a special relationship with the United States. It used this relationship to leverage power enough to buy a nuclear reactor from France, right? They wanted nuclear energy. That way they could focus on selling all their oil, right? The way the Russians did in the boom of the USSR when they were still making money. They said, "Oh, we'll use the the the, the uranium to power our cities and everything, but we'll sell the oil and we'll become rich." Okay. So since the the US couldn't bomb them directly because they were supplying them with weapons at that very exact time 
to go to war with Iran, the United States gave the location to the Israeli Defense Force uh, uh, airstrike capability on on the front line, and they destroyed the nuclear reactor. Now, that's what something we wanted done, but we weren't able to do it, and so Israel did it. So whenever I hear things that say, oh, Israel wants a regional war, and the United States doesn't, well, they don't do anything that we don't tell them what to do. And if we want a regional war, it's because we think we're in a position to win. We think that Russia's way overstepped, that it's bogged down in the Ukraine. It doesn't have the ability to to, to reinforce its proxies in the Middle East the way it used to. You know, Iran is is not in a position now where it, it was only facing one threat. Now it's facing a coalition of 10 uh, uh, different countries that are actively in the Red Sea. You know, we put the fleet there for a reason. We knew what the Yemeni were going to do. We understood, we, we calculated, why haven't they been hit yet? That's a wonderful question. People ask me that every day. Why haven't we hit the Yemeni? But what? No. Listen, that may be a, a famine-starved country, but it is littered with weapons from that war. That's what happens when you have a war. That's what happened in Afghanistan. That's what we were planning. That's what the United States was planning. That's why whenever you hear these things, oh, Joe Biden is dementia and he left a bunch of weapons in Afghanistan. No, how about this? For the people that watch your show, why don't you do this? Google border incident Afghanistan. After we left Afghanistan, uh, we had three border incidents where there was a fight, a firefight between the Taliban and between people that were in Iran. So we thought, This was our gamble. We're going to leave a bunch of stuff there. There'll be eventually more hostilities between these two people, and they'll hurt each other even more. Imagine that. And and, and if you don't think that's true, if you think, oh, technique, you're just you're making this up. The whole reason we're in the Ukraine is not to free those people. If you watch the Republican debate here, the people say that the quiet part out loud. They said the Ukraine is useful in grinding down Russia's army. So imagine how you must feel as a Ukrainian person saying, wow, my existence is just for a political objective. My entire country was destroyed. 30% of this land is gone just to receive a political objective. Well, now they know exactly what it's like to be a person from Central Asia or a person from the Middle East whose lives were completely destroyed because someone else had a political objective. I mean, to to quote Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the leading Democratic candidate up until the war in Israel, uh, in Gaza, he said that imagine Israel as a as a big as a big aircraft carrier in the Middle East, and that it'll <laughs> act as a bulwark against uh, against Russian and Chinese influence in the Middle East. This guy is so called a principled anti war guy. He wants to protect the American people from you know vaccine injury. He wants to protect the American people from the environmental changes that are happening rapidly. At the same time. He's so-called an anti-establishment candidate. You know, with what happened to his uncle and his father, you would assume that he he would know the price of freedom. But this guy is is such a shill for the Zionist agenda. And like you said, left, right, Republican, Democrat, whatever, the forever war continues. Uh, the foreign policy program continues. The deep state, you know, these these faces change. And this is something that's very fascinating, I think, and Heather would agree with me, and maybe our more Pakistani audience would also agree, is that this is something we've known in the third world forever. In the global south, we've always known that you can change the government, you can change the leaders, but whatever the deep state wants to do with regards to its domestic and foreign policy, it's going to do. What I mm. think uniquely, and this is pulling back to the original comment I made about the, the spectrum sort of looping in and becoming one big circle, is that I think the American people are starting to realize that it does not matter if they vote Republican or Democrat, which is why I think Donald Trump was a big FU for a lot of conservative people. Maybe they didn't get the, the big the big hurrah that they wanted, but for them, what it meant was that this is our way to to signal to the to the deep state, to the to the, to the permanent government, to the government bureaucrats, to the to the big billionaires, right? And this is a big you know f u to you guys, and and we don't give a shit about mm-hmm. your program anymore. Right, but but he turned out to be. We're going to tell the billionaires f you by electing a billionaire. Right. And it's funny because <laughs> I, I think that the guy. First of all, they both they both had a political makeover, right? Joe Biden had one of the biggest political makeovers in history. You know, he went from being an authoritarian 
racist old man to being like a fun loving grandpa that was trying to somehow solve America's problems like a Disney movie. Yeah, right? yeah fighting Pop. I, I think it, they're they're both layovers from the Obama administration. You know, um, Mr. Biden is or was the vice president in kind of working in the shadows. And, you know, I think when it comes to Mr. Trump and Obama, they kind of both set the stage for Biden in the sense that Mr. Obama made spineless liberals who never really did anything for anyone feel like they were progressives, like they were some kind of rep, like they were the resistance, you know? And I think uh, Mr. Trump made stupid people feel smart and empowered. You know, you're not a doctor, you're not a political scientist, you know nothing about the world. You know, some of you people think we're on, this is a flat earth and we're on a floating credit card in space and you give individuals like that credence. And then we started the conversation with 9-11. One thing we should have told your audience from the gate is that America is still living in the shadow of the 9-11 effect. And the 9-11 effect is when all politics shifted to the right. So if you were middle of the line before 9-11, you're considered a leftist now, it, it, even though you have no characteristics of a leftist. You're, you don't care about workers' rights. You don't care about insurance. You don't care about uh, people getting ripped off by, by by pharmaceutical companies. Those are positions that the right wing and these fringe groups have co-opted. But that was the leftist position. You know, if you were some right wing asshole, now, now you're considered some middle of the line centrist, you know what I mean, egalitarian. And, and if you were from the far right, those freaks. Well, now you were just considered an everyday right winger. And I, I think that that in in many ways shapes the political atmosphere that you see in the United States now. A people that can't come together. Why, brother? Because they don't even have a shared history. Right. The, the, the propaganda has gotten so bad that if someone says that two plus two equals four. Right. Just to be angry, the other side will say, well, it might equal five in another dimension or, you know, it's like arguing with a child. And I think that's what we've gotten. We've gotten to that kind of childish level of politics where even if it's bad and bad for the entire government and and, and yet it's a, a goal that one party wants to achieve, the other will be obstructionist. And, you know, it it it, it goes to show you that everything is for sale. When you look at Mr. Biden um, and him basically going back on the promises that he made to immigrants and people that worked all during COVID, the immigrants that worked all during COVID and held the country economically together. And now they're all going to be deported under this title. Why is he making this concession to Republicans? Because he thinks and he's calculating they're going to fast track his weapons to Ukraine and, and Israel, which is where his priority is now. And he's willing to sell out other people to make it happen. And that unfortunately, is politics. I mean, if you want to hear a more brutal story, you can ask the uh, the Kurdish people um, how it worked out for them fighting ISIS for the United States for three years. Here, fight ISIS for us, and as a reward, we're going to do nothing while the Turkish government bombs you into oblivion and scatters your people to the wind. So I think... We'll do, you, we'll, we'll do you one better. We'll, we'll fund and arm ISIS. We'll do you one right, better. There you go. Right. So I I think you know we're we're getting to a level where I think you're right Americans are disillusioned but I think more than ever they're sticking to the script a lot of them are some of them see Mr Trump as uh uh the only one that's ever bucked the system right as opposed to someone who's more like a broken clock who's right twice a day but mm. you would never set your watch to a person like that. And unfortunately, when you look at Mr. Biden, he represents a dilapidated, broken. It, it's not even the left. He's a he's he's a center right. He was the center right of the Democratic Party. He was basically a very liberal Republican. And he was tasked to run with Mr. Obama as kind of this anchor to him. And he thought, oh, this young, you know, liberal black guy, where is he going to take the country? And mm. no. He wasn't going to take you anywhere that, that they didn't tell you they were going to go. And and the guy who ran against him, John McCain, if he had won, we would be up in arms. We would have called him a, a murderer. Except John McCain. Things that he, did. he wouldn't be up in anything because the arms. Yeah, he, he, but at the same time, we thought that he was the warmonger. And it turned out that the one that we elected, and I think that's the part that people get twisted, that what what people show you in politics is only a glimpse of what actually exists. And 
by that, what I mean is there's a, there's a great program that I watched as a little kid called I Claudius. And it was about the inner workings of like the Roman empire and the murders and the intrigues at court. And it's a great little series at the time that it was happening. No one knew it was happening. It was a guarded secret that this person was really this person's father or that, you know, they, they had murdered someone in secret, but these people held the highest positions of power. And I'm sure that all of these guarded secrets will eventually come out someday. It'll just be so far in the future that it won't be able to affect the people that did it. So I, I, you know, for the people that say, oh, that wait, wait, 20, 30 years, and we'll find the truth out about everything that went on with the war on terror. You know, we'll find out where the money was laundered. You know, men lie, women lie, but numbers don't lie. And there'll be some account eventually of what we did with those trillions of dollars. It may come to the fall of the of America. It may come to a complete revolution in the country. But at some point, we're going to get answers to those questions that people never wanted us to have. And it's going to be a sad day. You know, uh, one thing that we often discuss sitting here in Pakistan is how, as young kids, when we looked at America... You know, we thought of it as like this sort of bastion of free speech and, you know, equal rights for all and so on and so forth. And then, you know, as we've gotten older and as I would say that the world has gotten more and more interconnected, it started to seem like that, first of all, there's like this false dichotomy um, about, you know, with the regards to Republican Democrat it's more so that there's a group of very power, powerful individuals. Um, they are always in charge, as Aman put it. It's sort of, you can think of it like a permanent government. And they choose, they pick and choose which topics you are allowed to, you know, talk about. And from the outside, it seems like that there's, you know, a lot of freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Because, for example, in Pakistan, you know, they, you have that uh, room that you have. The Overton window is sort of very narrow. It's, yeah, very narrow. So you can, you know, you can't openly criticize certain segments of the government, for example. Uh, you could do that in the United States, but it seems like the, the lines are drawn um, in, you know, the, these pow, pow, uh, corridors of power about what people can argue about and those things you can argue your heart out you can you know take it to the uh, most maximum degree like gender like gender for example uh, but then when it comes to like more serious things it snowden. seems like like snowden for manning. example or you know um, chelsea manning chelsea manning or uh, what was the guy uh, jeffrey jeffrey epstein jeffrey epstein so stuff like that just gets you immediately shut down israel so, israel also <laughs> Yeah. So what do you think? Because, uh, you know, um, America's sort of foundation for its freedoms has always been that it's a democratic country that values the democratic process above anything else. But um, in regards to this... America was founded as a republic. It's barely democratic. I mean, it doesn't... It, does, it, 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 it respects those principles within its own country, allegedly, but it doesn't respect those principles in practice anywhere else. And I think that if, if we're talking about like American democracy, I think it's interesting to point out some lesser known facts about the US. Whether or not it's a democracy, it, it can act like an empire in terms of its foreign policy. And therefore it, it transforms itself into one. And it has this kind of hybrid society where, yes, it's a republic in the sense that, you know, there are elected officials that are supposed to come from the people to be part of this. But in a sense, what democracy without, you know, uh, uh, a check and balance, like checks and balance systems um, is really just, you know, an office for hire. You, you've essentially created not a democracy, but a kleptocracy, a government of thievery where people say, hey, man, if I can afford to pay for this, then I can create the laws that I want to. I, I can make it so I, me and my business is never taxed. I can make it so that I, I increase laws that affect 
you know, my my sector of society better for me. And I don't care how that affects other people. And I think that that, in a sense, became kind of government for hire. And in in many ways, in many ways, there are some very beautiful things about this country, some things that it's achieved. And in other ways, I think that people are blind to how people achieve those things. They achieve them by threatening to overthrow this country. You know, if you talk about January 6th, people who who love American politics love to bring up January 6th. But after World War I, did you know that there wasn't, you know, 20,000 angry, fat, drunk white people in front of the White House? No, there was almost 300,000, right? 300,000 World War I veterans. And these people camped out all over Washington to remind people, you asked us to fight your great war, and then you stiffed us for our benefits afterwards. How dare you? We're, we're going to throw, we're going to overthrow this country if you don't give us some kind of pension. And eventually they worked out some kind of deal. I mean, there's a, a book by General Smedley Butler that covers uh, that particular part of history. But, you know, it, even the people that have shown the most loyalty to this government, which is why I think it's sad when I see, you know, people that have to angle um, <laughs> angle rage, right? So it's not enough to just say, hey, man, these, these, these soldiers aren't getting their benefits. But hey, you know why these soldiers didn't get their benefits? It's because of this immigrant right here. He mm. took them and he came into this country. Meanwhile, the United States prints billions of dollars a year. Are, are you that fucking stupid that you think you didn't get your, your VA benefit money? because they gave it to an immigrant. No, your VA benefit money went in the pocket of some politician. It has nothing to do with immigrants. They could print the money that you need 10 times over. They just won't uh, because you haven't made enough noise for them to do that. If you build a national movement, it'll happen because we've created this society and therefore it's become a reactionary society. Uh, Not reactionary left, not reactionary right, just reactionary in general. For example, there's a water tower on the roof of my building. No one worries about that tower right now, brother. No one. But if it falls and kills someone tomorrow, you know what happens? Every water tower in this city will be checked, inspected. There'll be it all over the news. Is your building in danger? Could you be the next victim of this falling water tower? And there it'll be taken seriously. You know, in the same way, oh, you could be a victim of Al Qaeda. You could be the next person to get blown up. So that's why we have to go kill these people in some land that you can't even pronounce and you don't even know where it is. But don't worry, we'll take care of that for you. By the way, if you want to come fight for us, we'll give you college that used to be free. How about that? We'll give you something in return for your military service that used to be free. And what I mean by that is that, you know, state state and city university for the people that don't know, used to be free in the United States. And up until about the time that they killed the draft, and that's not a coincidence. Um, so when they disillusioned the draft, uh, they coincidentally started making people pay for city universities. And then a lot of other people had to just join the military. And, and now what we're dealing with is a quasi-militant society that wants to be open-minded, that wants to be some kind of uh, a bastion of free thought. But that can't exist in a vacuum. You know, it has to exist in practice. But do you think that uh, American society can sort of find its way out through voting alone and through just honoring the democratic process? Like, what do you think needs to happen in order for there to be a sort of reformation? Um, All right. Inside? I'm going to say something, but it's not going to happen. Uh, you have to get money out of politics. You can't have super PACs that give people $300 million on the side and us expect to think that that's not pay for play. Now, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat in this country, you know, pay for play is real. It it, it exists. It's why you have the senators and congressmen that you do. Um, but that's exactly the problem. The, the, those people are not beholden to you anymore. Right. They, they, they don't think the water comes from you. They don't respect the water. You're not they don't respect you. You're the water, but they don't respect you. They respect the person that controls the handle that is on the spigot. That's the person they respect. And the people who have that, unfortunately, now 
are multinational corporations, unions, other individuals that say, oh, I'm not paying any taxes. I want my my problems heard first. Um, and that's why they have the positions of power that they do. Is it possible for the American people to get it back? Yeah, but they'd have to get money out of politics. And that's damn near impossible. I think it 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 hobbles on until it 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 sheds its uh until it sheds its skin until it no longer needs to be you know this you know shining republic until it's like, listen we're an empire and this is what we're going to be I have a feeling, and i think we're going to reach that level at some I have point. a feeling by the way that the christian ayatollah is coming uh that the serpent that has been put in charge of the country is coming uh openly um you as a, as a progressive as a left leaning person you 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 guys had a chance with with bernie right And I feel like well, here's the thing. Bernie's it's not just a question Bernie's, of progressiveness. No, Bernie's been a real huge disappointment, don't you think? I mean, let's look at him on Israel right now. I don't know what. I mean, he was a huge disappointment to people who thought he was that left. I, don't I know, never saw him. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the Zionist lobby has on him, but you know the way he's come <laughs> out punching for Israel and, and you know all guns blazing. What about the Ron Pauls? What about the on the right and the left both? What about Jill Steins? What about these alternative characters? When will a third party be viable in America? When will the Libertarians or the Green Party or there's the an old saying? There's an old saying that a third party will always be the future of American politics. Somewhere and it's cool, the but it's true. It's saying, hey, that that that's just never going to be the case. Um, I will give you one example of where third party politics. was extremely instrumental in shaping you know the course of american politics and that was um a little known fact that the only people that ever got israel to halt settlements were eisenhower and george bush the first and george bush the first did it very similarly to how eisenhower did it he said if you don't stop these settlements which are causing a regional issue we're going to cut your loans we're going to cut your funding and Israel said what what do you mean that the 4 billion we get a year you're not yeah i'm talking about that that's cut and they were like jesus all right so we they paused the programs for about i think it was 16 months or something like that and it's not a coincidence that the next election um president bush ran against not one but two christian zionists one was a third party candidate called Ross Perot that was very trump esque right Uh, or I should say Trump copied pages out of his book you know very uh a uh, populist man of the people but he took a very important state in Texas away from Mr Bush and the winner of that uh election cycle was another Christian Zionist the man who would become president Bill Clinton so I think that when you look at these individuals you have to um understand that whether or not it's one party or another they're committed to the framework of what you know american imperialism represents overseas so irrespective of their their positions domestically that's the line that they have to toe so it's not that he wants to fight for israel he's already signed up for that you know it's like when you talk about the governments of saudi arabia and jordan you say well how come these arab countries haven't come to the defense of this of of, oh, we of know. gaza we know right and, we know. and then you say well wait a minute Here's an unfortunate truth how many of Russia's allies have criticized the war in Ukraine very few if none therefore what do you expect of America's allies you think just because they happen to represent the same people as those they might represent the same people but it's not the same government and that is where you find a distinction very clearly right look at the government of Saudi Arabia versus the people of Saudi Arabia and how they feel about Gaza the government of Saudi Arabia There is heading a- towards normalization a, i read a poll today just online 80 96% of people in saudi arabia uh want there to be a ceasefire they're horrified by what they see yeah, yeah. because it plays on their new see that's the other thing brother what you can show on this podcast when you could show the visuals of some horrific act those were gone americans were flying blind for years they had th- these people were criminally ignorant to what their government was doing they had no idea and now they're beginning to awaken to the atrocities of what's happened realize that 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 women and children were raped in the dark that people were killed for no reason that these countries these arab countries 
that the United States has as its allies served as places where they had black sites all during the war on terror. So, you know, that 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 sicko that was harassing like an, a, an Egyptian uh, uh, falafel guy, the, you, York, know, yeah. you know, the Muhabarat, you know, the, the yeah. Well, plenty of people became famous to the Muhabarat when the United States shipped them to Egypt to be tortured and then turned out to have nothing to do with anything having to do with 9-11. And I think that is a lesson that I learned in Afghanistan, that the CIA was paying um, either it was Northern Alliance people or other individuals that they were connected to. And I met some Northern Alliance people that are good people, but they said, no, there were people here that were selling people to the U.S. as if they were Taliban, no, as we if have, they were we Al-Qaeda. We have a Pakistani right? citizen. It happened right. in Pakistan, too. We have a Pakistani citizen right now in America. She's in, a, she's in a mental institution. She's called Dr. Afia Siddiqui. She was a medical doctor from America, trained and everything. Uh, the Pakistani government sold her back in the thousands, and she went to Guantanamo. <laughs> she was raped and beaten and tortured multiple times. Uh when uh, recently one of the one of the senators from pakistan tried to go and reach her they're not giving her they are not giving him a visa they don't let her sister by the way who's also a doctor uh, she goes every year from pakistan to meet her because now they've moved her from the black sites into into like a mental facility because they've basically broken her mind uh, mm-hmm. they don't let them hug she gets to meet her sister from like through plexiglass and <laughs> i think that in 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 no short uh, in no in no, you know uh, in in no particular order but people like you people like Whitney Webb people uh, uh, people like Abby Martin you have a lot of these journalists like Dan Cohen a lot of progressive journalists uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, uh, Max Blumenthal all of these people um you're doing this job for the past 10 20 odd years in America that I've always felt that the American people are the the sweetest simplest people on earth they just live in this fantasy land where they have no idea what their government gets up to, you know, with other regimes. And you mentioned Saudi Arabia. So people have no idea what, uh, 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 you know, regimes in the third world do to their own people on the behest of the American empire. And I think the American people knew more about these sorts of brutalizations. You had an opportunity with alternative media, right? Both on the left and the right. But you have people like Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, all these clowns, going around mm-hmm. online they had an opportunity to talk straight to the american people why do you think they dominate these online spaces like you guys have been doing this job for like 20 years with your rap with your right. with your music with your art with with journalism with hard hitting activism but for some reason uh, these zionist shills uh, from the alt right or whatever they get to represent the american people online that is so the alternative media that was supposed to be the watershed right that was supposed to be able to show these images to the american people why is it that even that space that alternative space gets dominated hmm. by the same media empire you know this was supposed to be I, like youtube wasn't supposed to be paid to play right. facebook wasn't supposed no, to be no no i i think i think like it's Twitter. yeah you're right but then again it became a new television station and therefore it was designed for that so if you build a new hollywood because you think it's going to be less corrupt tell me something is bollywood not corrupt yeah you built a new hollywood it's corrupt it's all corrupt it's all pay for play you go to 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 the the film industry in russia or india or any country in africa it's, is it going to be corrupt is it going to be pay for play yeah because it was designed like that i think the other part that you bring up in in reference to um look we don't have to go for extremes in in defining uh the the position that people have as a leftist or a right person or a progressive those things don't have to be labeled on a person i'll give you a, a prime example in latin america if you believe that that a miner right like a, a person that mines gold or some precious metal if they deserve you know a a a I don't know some percentage some some sizable percentage of the stuff that they take out of the ground and the company doesn't right then you're considered a a a communist if you consider that the company should get 80% of everything 90% of what comes out of the ground you're considered a capitalist and if you believe that those people should even have 10% if you believe that the people who work in those those fields and those mines should even have a fraction 
then you're considered a violent communist. They'll make that decision for you. So I think the, the, the labeling of people is not something that we label ourselves. That's what imperialists have begun. Oh, this guy's from the right. This guy's from the left. So they could identify who they think can be easily manipulated into some other angle because their position is never to fight you. It's to angle you off, right? They, they have a revolution in the country with poor people. What are they going to do? Hire one and a half to go fight the other, of course. You know, they have a, 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 a growing group of revolutionary black people in the country. Well, what should we do? I get it. You know what we should do? We should draft them in a war to fight these other uh, proletarian Asian people. Great idea. So I, I think that the United States always has solutions for its problems that it sees. But I think those don't advance the morality of the nation. And in terms of how people see it as as to whether it's it's communist or capitalist. Look, I myself have always had a, a, a slew of criticisms for Marx, right? One, that I didn't need a European man to come to the dark jungles of Asia, Africa, or Latin America and explain to our people the complex concept of sharing and collectivism. <laughs> we knew what that was for thousands of years. And to, to reframe it in a way that we have to go by your rigid rule system, that that's the only way I can be a true leftist or a true representative of the people. It's almost like they've polluted every title that they could possibly give you. Humanitarian. Look at that. Now it's polluted. NGO. Oh, God, we all know that's polluted because, you know, it, it, it's where people wash Shout out money. Shout Bill Gates. <laughs> My boy right. Bill. It's where the way people wash money. Like we say back, like we said in the very beginning of the, or earlier in the discussion, if you give 10 million to get 20 million, it's not a guy. It's, it's business. You're doing business. And that's what these people are doing. You know, Bill Gates and when made, charity, you know, Bill Gates made right. $500 million dollars from Pfizer BioNTech. And, and that in a sense is how you make money by doing charity. You know, people don't forget that the NFL is a 501c3. It's a charity organization. Yeah. Right. That, that's how that's how they 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 get a lot of the tax breaks that they have. And I, I think that that in many ways causes um, or not that specifically, but that frame of mind where everything is for sale, where we're just trying to get around the system. Um, you know, it, 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 it it's always going to leave somebody with the short end of the stick. At, at this point in American politics, it's immigrants. They're being blamed for everything. But if you look at the comments You see, oh, man, these immigrants are getting stuff they don't deserve. Then you say this should go to the homeless veterans. What about the people that fought for this country? Okay, you know what's really funny? Go to one of those posts where they build houses for homeless veterans, and they'll say, oh, these people had their shot. What the fuck? They're a drain on the resource. Why don't you get a real job, asshole? Right, so it's, the, 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 the consensus is never going to be happy. So uh, we don't think about pleasing them. We think about taking care of the people who need to be helped, not the talking points of devilish uh, uh, individuals who, who, regardless of how it's framed, are going to see some problem in helping people, right? Even though they got help, right? That's the funny part, that they hate other people getting help when they got help. The GI Bill, every aspect of how America used to run 20, 30 years ago. You could buy a house with one medium income. All you had to put down was 2% on that fucking home. Jesus Christ. And look what we're living in now. A fucking, uh, a, an apartment in a slum, in some shithole in the worst part of New York City is $350,000. $400,000. That's unconscionable. And if and if BlackRock yeah, has their way, to exist in if BlackRock right. has their way, you won't even, you won't even own that anymore. Uh, you won't own anything and you'll be happy. It, it'll be ride share models and rent share models and, and Ubers and everything will be everything will be rented out to you. You won't own a car. You won't own a house. You, heck, you don't even own the clothes on your body. You can rent them. It, it's the game. I, mean, I think regardless of which side you pick, whether it's an extreme of the right or extreme of the left, you always end up there, right? right. And I think that um, there's a, there's a, a, a book by... Um, a historian called Diop and it's civilization or barbarism. And it, it discusses like uh, a, 
a very interesting time, a Neolithic age in the in in human history, which I think is underreported because we always start at Sumeria, we always start at ancient Egypt, but then you ask yourself, okay, well, what was around here sixteen thousand years ago? What else was here? And then you read about you know the first people that domesticated the horse about. Uh, uh, I think it's 16, 17,000 BC. Um, and then you read about a society that existed in Europe that was run completely by women. Uh, and, and it existed in like a fertile Crest Valley, not far from the Azov Sea. And these people existed in this gigantic valley for the better part of 3,000 years. Right? Imagine that. And one day it ended when the people who domesticated the horse came in and stole and burned and killed everything. So it it really we're we're stuck in this in this way of thinking that we want to create the most stable world, and yet nothing is stable in our world, and we're 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 living on a little atom, you know, hurling through space, and at any particular point our sun could flare up, and this shit will get cooked like a marshmallow. So how about this? I'll leave people and your audience by saying be nice to individuals, right? Be kind. Be understanding, you know, and if I can give people advice on how to get along in the world after we've discussed so many serious topics, I would say that an easier way to get through life is to assume ignorance from a person before you assume malice. Now, once you know this person, you can assume all the malice because you understand who they are. Right. And you you never really know a person until the moment that they don't get what they want from you. That's the first day that you actually meet them as a complete person. So whether it's your mother, your father, your brother, your best friend, the people that are in your life, until you say no to that person when they need something from you, you haven't really met all of them, right? You've just met most of them. And that's the truth. We only show a little bit of ourselves to people because if we showed them everything, they would think that we were more monstrous than we are or or maybe take us in a different light. And that's what social media has done to humanity. It showed everyone, all of us, not the friendly faces we like to show people when we're walking home, but those ugly racist things that people say and those inhumane things that they can do to women and children and those terrible things they do to people while they think no one is looking, right? In that sense, we we draw the most from this. And as to your, your point, why don't people that speak the truth, you know, get more um, of an audience or I, I think that that is interdependent, right? Um, artistry and things of that nature are not just based on a linear time schedule. They, those people who, who dominate the YouTube cycle in the future will be seen as the propagandists that they were in the future. People will be able to not encrypt your email. They'll just open it up like we're opening a jar and they'll find out that you got $12 billion, $12 million over the years to speak for this millionaire. And that's why you had the opinions that you did. Whereas these people did it because they felt in their heart of hearts that they were trying to do the right thing. So look, 2000 years ago, there was a man called Tiberius, the most famous man in the world. He was a living God, right? And people worshiped him. He had statues And at the same time that he existed, there was a Hebrew carpenter that people nailed to a cross for sedition, right? And if I ask kids in the street right now, anywhere, anywhere, I said, man, who is Tiberius? Who the fuck are you talking about? But if I ask people in the world, man, who is Jesus? Or even if I go to Pakistan, it's not a Christian country. I say, who's the prophet Isa? Everyone knows who he is. Everyone knows his story. Everyone knows that he, he stood... For justice, he, 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 he flipped over the money-changing tables. He said it was easier for a, a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than it was for a rich man to enter the gates of heaven, right? Th- th- these are the s- stories that we love. So while those people may dominate the news cycle today, I have a feeling that the work that I do will far outlast me and my life. And in a sense, that's why what I have is an immortal technique not something for now for us to enjoy but for people who watch this show you know on a manufactured device that's barely holding itself together you know six thousand years from now and say what were people like back then and then they'll get to hear you know me and you guys having a conversation about what the world was like then 
That's who we're talking to. And if we're really artists, then that's who our real audience is. It's not just the people now, but we're thinking about the people that may want a glimpse into what our world was like thousands of years from now or, or whenever. And, and that's who we're talking to as well. So, Technique, before you go, one last question. Mm-hmm. And this is something that, you know, uh, <laughs> we've had on our minds for quite some time. Uh, and initially... it uh, came to my mind when i heard uh, your track fourth branch uh so at the end of that there's like this monologue and at the end of the monologue you're like turn off the tv and read 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 so you repeat it three times and now i don't know if that was intentional or not but it echoes the first revelation that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam received from the angel gabriel who uh, essentially told him to read three times he repeated three times just like you did mm-hmm. so yeah. you know we've had this question on our minds for quite some time there's been debate online um, <laughs> are you muslim oh that I get that question all the time Um so I'll give you a a brief history. I never took shahada, right? But I read the Quran, um I read a lot of the hadiths, um and I studied the history of Islam. Um as I studied the history of Christianity, and one thing that I always thought was weird is how people in my family were so religious, they believed in Jesus. but they knew nothing about the time period in which he came from they knew nothing about how the religion had developed and one of the saddest things that i got from reading the history of islam and the history of christianity and the history of judaism is that the people who created um these faiths were people of extraordinary power in whatever way you want to interpret that but they had incredible power and the moment that they passed on the moment that they ascended or however you regard they're they're leaving this physical world there is no doubt in my mind that their religion fell into the hands of lesser men and unfortunately people took their religion and took their faith and took the effect that they knew that it had on people and they used it like a weapon um and in that way they desecrated the words of the prophet muhammad they have abandoned the lessons of jesus christ and they have turned their back on moses the lawgiver and i think that when i said that sure we love to include um imagery and and things that i i'm i'm going through reading at the time because at the time i i was reading the quran and i was like oh man this is an interesting so it, so it was so I, i think it's Yeah, sure there's a lot of stuff that's intentional that's brought, like when people ask me Al Aqsa the name is not coincidental they say what is that about Okay and wait wait wait, say, wait, well, wait 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 before you say that Aman and I actually recently listened to that song and we came yeah. up with a theory we looked up Al Aqsa um you know what it means and means the furthest point so the point of no return basically Right in the sense that name is not coincidental but yeah. it it's also a double meaning because the point of no return for human society in that region uh, will come when they try to disassemble al-aqsa mosque and i oh, i think this wow, is a very real myth. and it, i think i think we're at the we're at the cusp of it right now i think you see the sort of very extremist Look, sort of the, zionist in israel there's yeah. a, if you don't want to join the idf there's an alternative now you can join something called the temple mount society Yes. And several people have spoke about this and they've spoke about how this society is dedicated to the destruction or rather they call it the removal and replacement of Al-Aqsa Mosque with the uh unearthed Temple of Solomon underneath which the they think temple. was created. Now, remember that Solomon didn't rule alone, right? Solomon had Hiram Abiff, which was what they call the master builder. a person that designed ziggurats and shit like that that could angle things so that they would receive light from the sun in certain ways like I, these are the rumors that people have now whether or not it's true he also ruled with another man called Zadok the priest right Zadok the priest uh it's funny if you watch Indiana Jones and the last crusade the guy 
who those Nazis dress up as when they open the ark is supposed to be Zadok, the man who created the, who helped Solomon create the ark. And when he says, oh, it's a telephone to talk to God, it's not a telephone. It's a listening instrument so you can hear what God has to say and say, okay, God, this is what we're going to do. All right, nope, that's not you getting an intercom so you can bark at God and tell him what you want to do. And that I found so interesting, those 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 gems hidden inside. Like in the Torah, it says one of the worst things, that the greatest sins that a human being can commit is when it puts itself on an equal footing with God. And I read that again and again and again. And then there are stories that I, I read in the Quran that, that inspired me about a man that goes to hell and he, he lives there. And so he begs the Prophet Muhammad, can I please just get a glimpse of heaven? And, you know, the Prophet Muhammad gives people glimpses of heaven that are stuck in hell. And this man gets a glimpse of heaven. And instead of being bitter and angry like everybody else, he said, no, I'm, I'm resigned to this place now. I can see the good things in life that I don't deserve because of my actions. And the man is redeemed, letting me know that even if you're in hell, even if you're in a miserable place that you've condemned yourself to, to eternity, God's eye is still on you. He can still see you. He still made you. And that, that story about the creation of the devil and of wickedness and of evil, I remind people that in all those stories, again, the devil is something that God controlled, that God made, that God created. And so in that sense, it's a test for you. It's a reflection of what you have, which is why we call it jihad. It's an internal struggle. It's a, it's a thing that's born from within. So only you know whether you stole that. Only you know whether you killed people in the night. Only you know what you did in, 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 in secret behind closed doors. And that's the part that eats away at you. It's not some mystery being that comes to claim your soul in the middle of night by crawling out from under your bed. It's you that slowly eats your heart and your soul away because you know what you did was wrong, because you know that you feel guilty for the things that you've done. And I think coming to terms with, with your faith, if you find it through Islam or through Christianity, or Judaism, you come to terms with those things and you, you, you in a sense, not put yourself, you, you get a glimpse of godliness by forgiving yourself and by accepting uh, uh, the idea that you have to s- submit and lose your ego in order to really atone for your own sins. And I think that's the part that Christianity gets wrong. They say in this country, evangelicals have this idea that you just have to say you're sorry to Jesus and it's all forgiven. And they're forgetting the other half of Christianity, which is extremely important, which is you have to atone for your sins. Your sins cannot be forgiven if you simply just give it to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, let me throw this on your fucking lawn. Here's more sins. No, 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 no. Here's a sin and a promise that I'm going to do better than what I did before. And I'm going to be a better person. That I'm going to make amends to the people that I hurt and the people that I did wrong. And at the same time, I think without that, then the whole story is lost, you know, because they're all great stories, right? The guy comes back at the end, he saves the world, you know, they all end in the same light. But again, I'm interested in all of those stories. So as much as I read the the, the Quran, the, the Torah, the Bible, I read the Hammurabi Code. I wanted to read the 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 mythology of the Sumerian people, which I thought was extremely interesting. You know, here's, uh, basically it's a story about aliens, that they existed on this planet before us. It's a story older than the Bible and the Quran and the Torah, and they were mining gold on this planet, right? Because it was so powerful. And no, one interesting like thing is, no, no, but this is true. This, I know I'm missing you. A, this is not a farce. This is what they believe in. Today's, today's religion is tomorrow's mythology. Let's not forget that. Mm. That's the truth about human history. Today's religion is tomorrow. Whatever you think is so holy today, right? You know, you get in a lot of trouble, you know, just criticizing or insulting the Prophet Muhammad or belittling Jesus. People frown upon that now. But no one's going to get mad if you make fun of Zarastra, right? Or Mithra. Or if you say, oh, hey, or less people will, because I'm sure there's some Zarastras out there. Or if you make fun of the Greek gods, 
because their sanctity is not protected because people have accepted that their mythology. And in the future, the question becomes, will people accept that what we believed in was mythology? Or, or how will it be? Or how long do beliefs and society last? Right? We're on the ass end of our human society. And we're wondering how much the ideals that we've preserved exist. Okay, well, those ideals are only as good as the people that hold on to them. So as long as you keep producing decent human beings, you'll still have that. But if you don't, then you'll have people that misuse the word and use it to gain power and control. Like I said, the moment somebody saw Islam and saw Christianity, even a fucking, even a a, a stupid, wicked person said, oh, wow, that's power. Look the po- Look at the power. Look at the influence that this has on people. I want that power. Right. And in many instances, society has been governed by people like that because it reminds me of the music industry. We'll take it full circle in the music industry. There's this belief that you have to be talented. No, you have to be driven. I've never seen a person. I've seen plenty of people win with no talent. I've never seen a person win that wasn't driven. Maybe they just had better marketing schemes. Right. To the point where, you know, there's there's a, a an instrument that everyone loves in this country, a, a jazz trumpet. I used to play the jazz trumpet when I was a kid. If I took a person that's never played the jazz trumpet before in their life and I put them on stage with a professional, you would notice the difference. You gentlemen that are watching this show and your entire audience would say, oh my God, this guy is a fucking wizard. And this other guy, what are you doing? Can you get a hook and get him off stage? Is there a tomato I can buy to throw at this man? This is awful. But in hip hop, since there's no gatekeeping, we have people who've never rapped before, don't know how to rap, that just basically created a song, put it up, and then <laughs> and, and people love it, and that's it. And then listen, SoundCloud, it. SoundCloud rap has its own place. I mean, I, I will not stand for this kind of insult. Uh, <laughs> all these people sing talking online. I mean, they have a space. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think look, there's there's genius that comes in all in, in all shapes and forms, and I, I would never talk down someone's ability to express themselves. I just think that there's there's no sense of what talent actually is versus you know what people say you can monetize. Um, Speaking of which, when in this is, day and age, anything could be. When is your next album coming out? Because oh man, here we, and and what a wonderful way to end this <laughs> interview. No, no, no. Um, so I, for the people that don't know, I've been working on um, a 501c3 that feeds elders in my community in Harlem. We call it Rebel Army Runs. You can find me at Rebel Army Runs. And at the same time that I was doing that, me and my father, my father of all people who I didn't have a good relationship with when I was younger, but as a, uh, a grown man, I grew to accept that a lot of the things that he did were for the best of me. And you know, I, I learned to put to perspective a lot of his harsh upbringings and we actually get along very well now Mashallah, and so me and my dad we built a studio you know it, it took me realizing a lot of the things that i did wrong you know and 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 the fact that i was living like a criminal at that time and that i was constantly carrying drugs and weapons and when i looked at that it was, it, it was something my father Murderous said to me methodology yeah it was it was something my father said to me that really connected with me one day he threw me out of the house What and age? I was really mad at him for that. He said, you know, you, you can get out. How old and I was probably about um, 14, 15 years old. And he said, I want you out. And I, I was mad at him for so many years for that. And I remember his reasoning to me. And my father was in the Peruvian military when he was really young. And he said, listen, if if there's a submarine and there's a hole in one of the hatches on the side, I have to close that hatch. He said, you know, it may cost the lives of 12 men, but if I don't close that hatch, it threatens the integrity of the entire sub and 115 men will die. He said, so you're my firstborn son and I love you more than anything else. He said, you know, you're, you're, you're an example of everything positive. He said, but you cannot threaten the integrity of this family by having those things in this house. I don't know who would come looking for that. I don't know what kind of problems you have with people. I can't endanger my wife and the other children that are here, your brothers and sisters. So I want you to get the fuck out. And I left and I was heartbroken. And I carried that anger 
for so long until I was sitting in prison. And I told this story to somebody. And to my surprise, the man said, your father was right. And you needed to be here in this miserable fucking dungeon, living off two meals a day Looking in at a the cage world for, a for, 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 for you to get that your father was right. Right. And it's true. Everything that I say, I've said it, I've lived at some point, you know, every time that you quote something from a lyric of mine, it's something that I went through. It's something that shaped the, pers the perspective that I have. I'm and sorry if we overdid that, that part. Helped me find my dad. We're, me we're, find glad that, we're glad though that you didn't shoot it out to get clapped because. <laughs> really, hey man, we love you. You never here. know. Hey man, we're talking about the future. Who knows how people? No, end. No, no, hopefully, no, no, we have no, a positive no, ending, right? No. <laughs> it's gonna have a beautiful ending that you've reconciled with your father and your siblings, and it's perfect. It's beautiful, yeah. mashallah. So we built a studio, and we'll be recording the rest of the the record that I have um, in that studio. So. I have a few songs that are actually completely finished and then I have a couple that um could use some work. So I'm I'm looking forward to next year and I'm definitely I'm already slated to release a new song. So, you know, if if people like it then that means that there'll be more songs. So I hope you guys like the first song. So <laughs> there could be more songs and yeah. we'll we'll keep them coming. For sure we'll be And hopefully when I release the record I can come back on the podcast too. Definitely, man, for sure. That would be an honor. Sir, uh, so one, I promise this is the last thing I'm going to ask you. <laughs> That's all right. This is the last thing I'm going to ask you. Um, you know, Aman alluded to it earlier. You did like this song with uh, DJ Green Lantern um, called, uh, I think it was called Bin Laden, where the hook literally is uh -huh. Bin Laden didn't blow up the projects. And you know, yeah, Bush, Bush knocked down, 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 uh, down yes, the yes. It was a it was taking a sample from from most Def's yes. freestyle. Yeah, it took, uh, and then he put from, he was Eminem's DJ at the time, so yeah, he yeah. put he sampled Eminem at the end. At the end, so you know, I imagine like uh, it's not a very popular position to hold in America. You know, over here in Pakistan, everybody's like, yeah, for sure, obviously, Bush knocked down the towers. Um, What do you think? Do you think 9-11 was an inside job? I've always wanted to ask you this. You personally, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, before, I, before I go, I, I, I'll say it like this. When people say, hey, what's your crazy conspiracy theory about 9-11? Well, if you listen to volume two closely, I, I don't have one. I didn't say that there was uh, that there was a nuclear explosion inside. I said what it looked like. I said what this was. I put a theory forward that the government lied to us. And I stand by that theory. Now, how they lied to us and what exam what what the extent of their lies were, I think that I am humble enough not to purport to know the exact reasons. But I will say this. I know that they lied because they lied about the air to breathe. And I know that because a lot of my friends were in the military at that time and they were forced to guard the southern part of Manhattan. So after 9-11, a little known fact is that you weren't allowed to go to the south of Manhattan, that it was under, like, military occupation. Like, there were checkpoints, there were Humvees, soldiers in New York City. We had never seen that before. We're used to seeing cops. We saw soldiers, M16s, people in little machine guns. They, they really thought, they like you guys said, they really thought we were under attack. Every day was going to be, like, fucking Beirut in the, in, in the 80s. And that's how they really thought. And so they prepared themselves for this never ending onslaught. But what actually happened is that this government lied to all those people. And it said that the air was safe to breathe when we found out later that it wasn't safe to breathe. And plenty of my friends and people I know have died of respiratory illnesses or they're fighting some of the most horrible ones and they can't breathe. They've barely beaten a lung cancer. So I don't want to hear from anyone that this government told the truth. Uh, the other little tidbit fact about 9-11 is you know how they identified Muhammad Atta. Now this is the truth. This is why I tell people it's important to read Mark Twain and the originals who who, who are like American literary icons. Not because the stories were so great. Who gives a fuck about their stories? The, the, the reality is that you get gems from the inner workings of their writing where Twain says that writing... The truth is harder to write than fiction. Why? Because when you write about what really happened, you have to make it seem believable because the truth is so outlandish 
that it doesn't make any sense. 16 people from Saudi Arabia, a guy from Egypt and Lebanon, hacked a jet and, with a bunch of box cutters. And in response, we destroyed two countries that had nothing to do with it and damaged 10 others in the process. That makes no sense, right? And you know how we identified Mr. Mohammed Atta, getting back to the original point, is they found his passport intact after an explosion of the caliber that I saw on television where a plane went through a building and blew up and it wasn't even singed. And the sad part is this. I'll end with a sad story. I had a friend of mine, she went to college and she got really quiet after 9-11. I said, what happened? And she said, my best friend died. I said, how? What? what how? What? She said, she's going to work in front of the World Trade Center. And she said that she was hit by building debris and jet fuel, and it burned 90% of her body. And she lived for three days in a hospital, fighting for her life, and then died. And what's sad is that that woman represents the truth. It gets seen for one split second of time. Everyone acknowledges what it is. And then it dies alone in a room by itself days later, away from the public. You know, I love you people. I love your fans. I appreciate you guys having me on the show. And I tell people, man, dig for the truth, even if it's messy, even if it hurts you to read, you know, even if it challenges your narrative of the world, you know, it, 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 it's never too late to educate yourself and become a better person. And you know what? Call your mother, right? If you're still lucky enough to have your mother in your life, man, call your mom. That dude that's walking around aimlessly in the background, tell him to call his mother too. You know, she would love to hear from you and it would probably make her night or your grandmother's night. And I'm lucky enough that my mom beat cancer twice and she just beat another round of cancer now, which makes it three times. So I consider myself blessed to have my mom in my life. And that's why I tell you people, please, you know, appreciate it to the full extent and then beyond because... See, this is the part where you were actually supposed to have your line, brother. See, you've been quoting me this whole time. God damn it. Appreciate them to the fullest extent and then beyond because you never really know what you got until, until it's, it's gone. gone. There you go. Hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate Sir, you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Show. This was amazing. If you want to find me, I'm online on Twitter, Immortal Tech, um, and I'm on Facebook at Tech Immortal and, and uh, IG on Tech Immortal. And I appreciate you guys. And please let me know when the episode drops so I can uh, I can put it out to my fans too. For sure. Thank you so much for coming. And we hope to have I you all again. I appreciate you, gentlemen. Bye Peace, bye. gentlemen. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.